It is my privilege to address you as one of the thousands of employees of 20th Century Fox. One year ago, we launched the first CinemaScope demonstration. In one short year, the trademark CinemaScope has become a symbol of something new and something better in the art of entertainment. The entire studio system is crumbling in the early 1950s due to the fact that network television had taken away the mass audience from the theatrical film. And the film industry was scrambling to survive, was searching for strategies to deal with the popularity of television. Fox Studios risked everything by betting on CinemaScope. William Fox himself recognized television as a threat in the 1920s, and that was one of the reasons that he uh, developed a widescreen system called Grandeur with 70 millimeter film back in 1930. The Grandeur system failed because primarily the depression, the economics of the time wouldn't allow them to equip the theaters with special projectors and make the changes they, they needed to do. In the late World War II period, 1943, 44, 45, Hollywood was hugely successful with anything they put out. Television came into the world in America and the movie studios, instead of embracing television, felt it was the enemy. All of the Hollywood majors were scrambling in this period to find something to solve their TV problem. Fox was in dire straits and my whole industry was experienced a downturn. People didn't go to movies and the studios found themselves in a lot of trouble. And Cinerama and 3D seemed to point the way. You really had to have a knockout of a movie to get the audiences to come. September 30th, 1952, at the Broadway Theater, was the world premiere of a phenomenon called This is Cinerama. Playing in just one theater outgrossed all the other, all the Hollywood films. It was basically three moving pictures shot side by side and exhibited side by side on one huge continuous wide screen. Unfortunately, there was a, a very visible seam between the images had no actors, had no story, had no advanced publicity, so to speak, and it still just had people lined up around the block. Spiros Kuros, who was the uh, head of 20th Century Fox, had seen Cinerama in earlier demonstrations in 1940, 1949, and 1950, and he had been advised by the Research and Development Department at Fox that it was of no use to them in its current form. It required a major theater conversion, or really, truly, newly built theaters to exhibit it properly. Daryl Levzanek, who was then vice president of production for 20th Century Fox, thought it would be wonderful to come up with an alternative widescreen stereophonic system to compete with This Is Cinerama, but not have the split images. And he talked with my old friend Earl Sponable, who was on staff as the director of research for 20th Century Fox. Fox knew that they had to get equipment that the theater owners would be happy to, to have without you know, breaking the bank. We needed something exciting, and uh, we had good people all along the line to help. 20th Century Fox was unique in that they were the only studio that had a research and development unit uh, continuously operating from the early days, since 1926, when they started with movie tone sound system. Sponable remembered, back in the 1920s, having seen To Build a Fire, a short film version of the Jack London story using the lenses of Henri Chrétien. Henri Chrétien was a French inventor. He developed, in the 1920s, uh, anamorphic lenses. Uh, they allowed uh, twice as wide a picture to be squeezed onto a standard film and then when you project it back to the same lens, it widened it out again so you could fill a much wider screen. The J. Arthur Rank organization in Britain had an arrangement and uh, a contract with Henri Chrétien, the inventor of the anamorphoscope, this special system of anamorphic widescreen glass lenses. And Fox had to wait in late 1952 for their contract to lapse before they could go to France and jump on Chrétien and get their own deal with him. At the same time that they were negotiating with Chrétien to get these uh, lenses, a fellow named Charles Green had organized a bunch of, uh, of shareholders 
and was preparing a proxy battle to oust the management of Fox, to take Skiros and Zanuck and all of them, get rid of them and take the company, break it up and take the money and run. So this pressure was on Fox at the same time they're trying to develop this widescreen process. The key advantage of going with Chrétien's anamorphic system was not one of patents because actually the anamorphic system was in the public domain. Chrétien had invented it so many decades earlier. The key advantage though to having an alliance with Chrétien was he already had the lenses manufactured and Fox could grab those, bring those back to Hollywood and immediately begin shooting films with them. They didn't have to go through a manufacturing process immediately to create new anamorphic lenses. On December 13, 1952, Spiroscorus and Earl Sponable witnessed film that Henri Chrétien had shot in Paris in an anamorphic system. On December 18th, they bought the rights from him. On January 20th, 1953, the original Henri Chrétien lenses arrived in Hollywood at 20th Century Fox. I remember when we were first showing the process down at the old Fox Western Avenue studios. Uh, it was, I believe it was in a sound stage and they put up a screen and had a projector. And we saw the ocean liners in the uh, harbor of New York. And, oh. Uh, uh, just breathtaking. On January 26, 1953, Daryl Levzanek, the head of production, saw samples of footage shot with those lenses and decided at that time that the robe had to be shot in CinemaScope. Three weeks later, on February 23rd, the robe went into production as the first CinemaScope movie ever. Fox announced with much fanfare that they would be abandoning the old aspect ratio, the old kind of squarish shape that movies were made in, and they would produce all their films in CinemaScope. Not just The Robe, but How to Marry a Millionaire, which was the second one, started shortly thereafter, and uh, Beneath the Twelve Mile Reef, three entirely different subjects, all feature length, all CinemaScope, and showing things in different ways. Fox offered stereophonic sound with CinemaScope that included not only left and right channels, but also a rear channel so that sound would appear to be coming from behind the audience, really putting the audience in the middle of the action. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, sound. Not that rather strange noise you just heard, but about a new system of high fidelity reproduction called stereophonic sound. All of us have been greatly impressed by CinemaScope, the way it opened up a world of increased vision more thrilling than anything the old movies ever gave us. Stereophonic sound, used in conjunction with CinemaScope, is one of the marvels of the electronic age we live in. This is natural sound, not only because of the improved methods employed in high fidelity recording and reproduction, but because it comes from a multiple bank of speakers placed in such a way as to cover the entire area of the large screen. The sound reaches you from its visual source in every instance, just as the voice of an actor emanates from wherever he may be on the stage. Into the carriage. Get him to Peter. Between shots, there were guards with guns. And, and the assistant cameraman would remove the CinemaScope lens and put it in a box and close it and lock it. And when they were ready for the next shot, they would unlock the box. It was all kind of ceremonial. And they're very small lenses compared to all the anamorphics made in Hollywood or made in the United States afterwards are, are much bigger. And they had trouble with almost every aspect of the performance of the lens. Leon Shamroy, who shot the robe, was maybe the premier cameraman, the top cameraman of Fox, a very strong personality. He had won uh, Oscar for the color on Lever to Heaven. The cinematographer Leon Shamroy and the director Henry Koster are faced with new compositional challenges in the robe in particular, which was of course the first Fox film to be released in CinemaScope. We had a, wor a problem while we're shooting the robe, and that was if there were upright columns, they seem to bend a little. These lenses tended to bend straight lines in unfortunate ways. They only had three lenses. They had three productions, so each production had only one lens. If you had to cover action with two cameras, if you couldn't borrow a lens off another production, 
you only had one anamorphic camera, one widescreen camera to work with. They varied in their ability to be sharp, to have definition. The Robe did not get the best one in that respect. Uh, How to Marry a Millionaire is a sharper looking movie. But the Robe had less distortion because these lenses tended to be squeezed more on the edges. People ended up looking a little thin if they get to the edge of the picture. When an actor approached the camera, part of the nature of anamorphics, unless you do a lot of compensatory things in the design, is that people will end up looking fat when they're projected in the theater. It's because the lens doesn't squeeze as much, but the projection lens still expands just as much. So Victor Mature, when he's at the crucifixion, if you look at his face, it's a round face. It's, it's more like a kid would have, you know, it's, a, it's, it's distorted. So they were working against all these problems. Here is the back of the lens, which is uh, designed to go right against the front element of a regular lens, the front glass of a regular standard lens. They also had to be focused separately from the normal lens. And it has to be focused and the regular lens has to be focused. It took two camera assistants. So you had one assistant, when somebody walks toward the camera and you do what you call a follow focus, where you adjust the focus as the person comes, one person would be running the prime lens, another would be running the, the little anamorphic lens, and they had to be exactly together. And if you watch the robe very critically, you see sometimes that doesn't happen. The robe seemed to be especially vulnerable to that because it was the first, and uh, all the experience with using these lenses had to be gained right then and there. Otherwise, they had never used this equipment before. The curse of empire. But think how we make it possible for your fine friends back in Rome to enjoy themselves. I am thinking about it. I was a publicist in the 20th Century Fox publicity department. I wrote every story about CinemaScope to introduce CinemaScope to the world. Every story, that was my assignment. And when Professor Henry Cretien came here for publicity purposes with his wife and his secretary and his daughter, I was with him that week. We were selling CinemaScope every way we could think of. They've got to convince theater owners, they've got to convince other studios, they've got to convince the public that this is it because they're putting a lot of money into this process. They spent totally at the end of this about $10 million to get CinemaScope put together. They had to buy um, equipment and in every, in every field and they needed to show the rest of the industry that they were serious, that they were going to put this system out and it was going to work, and they didn't have the system at that point. They had it in theory. Zanuck was very good at making CinemaScope essentially an industry standard. 20th Century Fox opened up the patents to every other studio. Fox was able to kind of rent CinemaScope out to a number of studios for a nice fee. The name CinemaScope, incidentally, was a trademark name owned by Don Federson at Channel 13 KCOP in Los Angeles. And he had a process, a kinescope recorder for recording TV broadcasts onto film. And he had the name CinemaScope trademarked. And uh, I think it was in March of, of 53, Fox said, that's such a good name. There's nothing else that's gonna do it for us. And they, they paid him $50,000 and bought that name. Because they owned the trademark for CinemaScope. They licensed the lenses to other studios for $25,000 each shoot. They were running Hollywood at the time with, with their process. And they very quickly got the Disney company to make 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. MGM produced several features in anamorphic widescreen based on CinemaScope as well. And all of this encouraged exhibitors, theater owners, to buy and attach those CinemaScope lenses to their projectors, and that meant that CinemaScope films could be shown almost anywhere in America. When I was a kid, movies were square. They were four by three. I lived in Pasadena at the time, and we had the, the best theater there, the Fox Theater that was their premium one, was the Academy. And I remember going in there one Saturday to see whatever it was, and the curtains were missing, and they had this giant screen. I mean, the most giant thing I ever saw. And I asked the manager, I said, what is that, Cinerama? He says, no, that's our new magic panoramic widescreen. I said, panoramic, he says, we're going to have the robe. He says, this is just the center of it. We're going to get the rest in about three months. So I saw the robe on Thanksgiving weekend in Pasadena, and I went with my folks. It was sold out, so you really, you had to wait, which was unusual in those days. So we waited, to, we're waiting for the film to finish and I snuck in through the, the, the 
exit at the rear and looked at the screen and I saw the biggest image I ever saw. I remember telling my folks, I said, this is really big. It was overwhelming compared to the size screens. There were screens were like 20 feet wide. Now also we have one that's 65 feet wide. It was just gigantic. CinemaScope was enormously important to 20th Century Fox. Fox really needed uh, some kind of jolt at that time. CinemaScope was a wonderful process for its time, but already by the 1960s, superior visual quality systems were being developed, most notably by the Panavision company. By the 60s, Panavision had sets of lenses that produced a much higher quality image than CinemaScope. In addition, I think the other studios didn't like licensing something from a rival company like Fox. They wanted to deal with somebody outside the traditional Hollywood hierarchy, and that was Panavision. Fox continues to use CinemaScope itself until 1967. And it's interesting that the first CinemaScope film, The Robe, and the last CinemaScope film, Caprice, were both shot by the same cameraman, Leon Shamroy. Eyeshadow or lipstick? Uh, our new industrial designer. Not a waste of talent. And I'm really glad that Fox took a bow for CinemaScope with a rope. It changed everything. Uh, CinemaScope was a bigger hit than we thought it would be. Uh, CinemaScope uh, has become as, as natural to us as flipping on the television. CinemaScope is hugely influential on Hollywood from the 50s all the way to the present. But the two and a half to one aspect ratio of CinemaScope becomes a key standard and is still with us today. I think CinemaScope was crucial to Fox's survival in the 1950s. CinemaScope is actually a very revolutionary process. A revolution, in my view, is something that may be lurking in the background for decades, and it's there, but it's just in the shadows. And then one day, for whatever reason, it comes down the, the track like a freight train. You can't stop it, and when it's through, everything has changed. Nothing is the same as it was before. CinemaScope came in, and within two years, if you didn't have a widescreen, nobody went to your theater. If you didn't shoot in widescreen, nobody was interested in your, your release. They didn't, it wasn't all CinemaScope, but they completely changed the face of Hollywood. And from 1954 or five, there has never been a conventional four by three screen there was, has not been a motion picture made or shown in that aspect since that time. That's, you know, 50 years. So it was a revolution. We at 20th Century Fox will continue to fight for the best in entertainment. We refuse to settle for something secondary or something somebody claims is almost as good as CinemaScope. We believe the theater goers of the world if they are to continue to patronize American motion pictures, are entitled to the best.